Hello again. Welcome back to Using the Debugger. In this lesson, we're going to run a recursive method in debug mode in order to learn more about how recursion works. Now, a recursive method is one that calls itself. Recursive methods can be very confusing. Since the method calls itself, and that method in turn calls itself, and so on, something must be changing inside the method that eventually ends the process. Otherwise, we would loop indefinitely. Now let's open the factorial method in the MyUtilities class. This is a very simple recursive method that calculates the factorial of an integer n. This is calculated as n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 down until n is equal to 1. For example, 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is equal to 120. Now if we look at the method, we can see that if n is greater than 1, then we come down here and it returns n times factorial of n minus 1. So it, that's why it's recursive. It's calling itself. And then when n eventually becomes less than or equal to 1, then it returns 1. So that's what ends the recursive process. Note that we don't really need this result variable, but we've added it in here because it makes it a little easier to follow this inside the debugger. We can also see how the method eventually ends and avoids an infinite loop. Because 1 is subtracted from n every time we call the method again, eventually n will get down to the value of 1, in which case we'll just return 1 and we don't call the factorial method anymore. Now as a side note, since this method returns an integer, and since the maximum value of an integer in Java is about 2 billion, this method will actually only work if n is less than or equal to 12. Now let's look at the method in the debugger. We'll put in a method breakpoint line 112 here. Then we'll open the My Utilities test class. Again, we have the factorial method commented out, so we'll uncomment that. We'll save. and then we'll right click debug as JUnit test. And again, this opens up our debug session. We stop in line 114 with n equal to 5. If we step over, we go to 117 because we, this test was false, so we went to the else block. Now, if we step over again, watch what happens to our stack frame. We've created a new stack frame on top, and that's because we called the factorial method again. And we've gone one level deeper in the program. Notice that the variable result is not listed yet in the variables view. This is because it hasn't been evaluated yet, since none of the factorial methods have returned a value yet. If we press resume, we go to the next call of the factorial method, and n is now 3. We'll press resume again, and we have another, yet another stack frame, and n is now 2. Press it one more time, and yet another stack frame, and now n is 1. Now when we step over line 114, we go to line 115, because n is 1, so now we're going to return 1 and not call the factorial method again. This is where we actually start doing our calculation. When we step over again, we lose the top stack frame, and n is now 2 again. Now we'll step over one more time, 
And now we have our first value in the result variable, which is the current n of 2 times the result of the factorial, which is 1. So 2 times 1 equals 2. Now let's step return to get out of this stack frame. And now we see that n is 3. And if we step over, we can see result is now 6, which is the previous result of 2 times our current n, which is 3. If we step return and step over again, now we see that the current result is 24, which is the previous result 6 times our current n 4. And if we step return again and step over, now we have our final result of 120, which is 24, the previous result, times 5. Now if we press resume, the method completes and we see we have our test result. Now let's run this a second time. So we can hit the button there. We'll resume until we get down to the n of 1. Now one way to think about this method is as follows. Each time we call the recursive method, we add another frame on top of the stack until eventually we get to this point where n equals 1. Now up to this point, no real calculations have been done. The frames are just holding the places for the yet to be determined return values from the factorial methods. Then, when we finally get to 1, we're not going to add any more stack frames because we're just going to return the value 1. Since the top frame can now return the value 1, then as we return out of this, each of the frames below it can now start returning values, and so the actual calculations take place. So the first part of the method is adding the stack frames until we get to the end of the recursion process. At this point, we get a result and stop calling the method and adding stack frames. The second part of the method is then returning the result of the topmost stack frame to the one below it and removing the topmost stack frame. When all the frames are removed, we eventually have the result. Now we don't know or care exactly how many stack frames we will need as long as two conditions are met. Eventually we need to stop calling the method and get a real result. Second, as a practical matter, we need enough memory to store all of the stack frames. Now seeing this happen step by step inside the debugger can make it easier to visualize how a recursive method works. If you like, you could modify the My Utilities test to test a different number, such as 4 or 6, and run through the debugger again on your own. While we're looking at this method, let's take another look at the drop to frame command. Let's rerun the debug session and press resume until we're at the point where n equals 1. So now n equals 1. In Lesson 4, we saw that we could use drop to frame to rewind the debug session. In that lesson, we did this by clicking on a previous line in the editor view and then pressing drop to frame. For example, let's step over line 114 and go to line 115. And if we click back here on line 114, we see drop to frame is enabled. And when we press that, we rewind the program back to 114. Now, a second way to use this command is to actually select a lower stack frame and go back to that frame. Remember that the top stack frame is where we are now in the program. So each lower stack frame is from an earlier point in the program. So if we select a lower frame, we go back in time. Let's select the second frame, 
and we see the drop to frame is enabled. When we press that, we lose our top stack frame and we go back to the frame where n equals 2. Let's try it again, this time going back to the first factorial method frame. So we'll click down here on the very first factorial method frame where n equals 5 and the button is enabled and when we press it, we remove the three stack frames that were above and go back to the point in the program where n equals 5. Now there are situations where you cannot use drop to frame because the program has done something the debugger cannot rewind. And in those situations, the button is disabled. For example, if we try to rewind to where we invoked the test, we see that we can't rewind to that point because the button is disabled. So we can use drop to frame either to rewind in the current method by selecting a line in the editor view or to rewind to a lower stack frame. Congratulations! You've reached the end of the Using the Debugger tutorial. I hope you've learned a lot and had some fun along the way. If you have any suggestions or comments about this tutorial, please consider posting feedback at the project website. Thanks for watching and happy debugging! I'm Mark Dexter saying so long for now.